really hope you are scared because I want to roll. Letter, letter, letter. Yako is silent already. Yeah. Mine may not be silent, and mine can be called. Okay. Welcome to the bold analysis, ladies and gentlemen. And I promised you that we will try to do it different as we give you the right answers that you deserve. I am in Nakuru and I want to speak to Dr. Mohoho, who is going to introduce himself. He is a lecturer at Mount Kenya University. And we're going to unravel the most important questions as matters of economics, or rather, we are going to get our economy back to it is, remember, the political class is saying that we have an economy that is at its deathbed. Is that really the truth? But without much ado, I want to introduce my guest today. But just before we start this interview, um, do you know that you can find a platform to market your services, that is rather uh, when you are selling um, um, uh, professional services like uh, tours and travel, you are into different industries like that of um, hiring, cleaning and all that. I introduce to you the Zuri.ke website. Visit Zuri and have an idea. Karibu sana. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank uh, you very much. Uh, let our viewers know you for the first time. Yes, my, my name is Dr. Michael Mohoro. Yes. Uh, Michael, uh, my, the, you the have host. said, yes. the host have said I'm a lecturer at the Mount Kenya University. I've yes. been here for the last 12 years. Yes. I had a department. Yes. That's right. Thank you for granting us this interview first. It's thank you. Thank you. And most welcome to Nakuru. Uh, yes. It's a bit chilly today, but usually Nakuru, uh -huh. it's a warm place. Yes. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy your stay in Nakuru. Yes, I'll enjoy my, my weekend here. <laughs> thank you. You're most welcome. I, I just want to help us. You, you can help us get an understanding of this. And the most important question is this. We have uh, scrapped the subsidies on fuel and unga because we don't want to subsidize the products. We want to subsidize on production. This is seen as a long-term solution to help us really solve a problem we are having, and that's called inflation. Do you think we are in the right track? Uh, let me start by saying that um, in economics, mm -hmm. we have two, two branches of economics. Yes. We have what we call supply-side economics. Yes and consumption side economics. Yes. Uh, the question is, how do we grow an economy? Yes. We can grow an economy, like developed countries are mm -hmm. growing their economies on consumption. On consumption. They promote consumption so yes. that the industries can supply, or rather can get the market. Yes. They actually talk of market thinking or market economics. Yes. Because what they want to do is, an industry is not doing well. Yes. You need to promote the market, consumption of the products the, the industry is producing, yes. and the economy grows. Yes. Production side economics, and this yes. mostly is in third world, in yes. countries that probably don't have all the industries yes. they require for the consumption of goods they are producing in a particular area. Yes. So they do aim at increasing production yes. of the goods so yes. that they can export if they need a foreign exchange. Yes. They do promote production of goods so that they can feed their market. Yes. They do promote production of goods as a way of leveraging yes. on the many items that they import through either export. Yes. Now, Kenya is still a middle income uh, country. country. Would I say still uh, bordering the lower income country? Yes. If you look at our economy, uh, we do. Uh, import more than 60% yes. of our goods. That includes even the food items. Yes. Uh, we do, the, uh, our biggest uh, import is fuel, that's energy. We do import machinery, yes. from cars to all the kitchen uh, machines that you might use. So the question that uh, many people and uh, some of us who are na analyzing our economy ask, do we go the supply side economics or do we remain in consumption side economics? Uh, in the previous government, our uh, emphasis was on consumption. Yes. Get hunger for people to consume. Yes. 
uh, assuming that uh, the factories that are uh, that are making unga really benefited maybe increased employment yes uh, s- subsidize on energy mm-hmm. and the assumption is energy drives most of our industries, industries. from from a farmer in Nyandaro who wants to take his potatoes to Nairobi yes. he relies on the cost of transport yes so if we take down that transport he might encourage him to grow more potatoes so that we can be able to feed our, our economy so uh, the new government yes talks of no we cannot uh, subsidize yes. consumption we yes. need to move now to what i'm calling a production economics yes that's where we are that's where we are that's where we are um this production economics eh? um people have argued that we are giving it the short term merit that perhaps we are we are subsidizing fertilizer when we with the short rains when we produce in the next 3 or 4 months we are going to boom in supply is it directly proportional the fact that if you if you subsidize on like for example let's speak fertilizer is it directly proportional going to boost the the outcome the the the, 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 the production i would say the jury is out there Yes. But uh, let's look at our food production because fertilizer is all about food, food production. production. Uh, f- uh, historically, mm-hmm. uh, in 50s and 60s and coming to 70s, mm-hmm. we were a food exporting country. Yes. The colonial economy mm-hmm. was all about production of food that was to be sent abroad and that's abroad. how our economy was. And uh, yes. Since then, we have always said our economy is agriculture is mm-hmm. agricultural based. Now when we turned into 80s, yes. uh, for some reason our food production, probably due to three reasons, our population growth yes. was very fast. Yes. Secondary our farmlands mm-hmm. were becoming fewer. Yes. And thirdly settlement areas, our mm-hmm. settlement areas were experiencing some turmoil yes. in terms of marketing of agricultural produce, in terms of infrastructure in yes. our heavy food baskets yes. and somehow our food production went down yes uh, that was compensated in our economy due to growth in uh, manufacturing and yes. we were able to import some items to our neighboring countries yes. of course remember in the early 90s our neighbors were in turmoil all yes. the way from DLC to Somalia mm-hmm. Ethiopia and to some extent majority of even southern africa yes so we relatively grew our manufacturing base but come to the new millennium by year 2000 most of our regions had stabilized they had grown their cottage industries and now here we are we are food insufficient and our industries are also being competed right and left mm-hmm. by our neighboring especially ugandan and tanzanian industries yes now we have reached a point where we are importing up to 50% of our food. our food. If you look at wheat, uh, wheat imports yes. is around 70%. Uh, much of our wheat land areas of Nalok, Nakuru here have actually been converted to other agricultural uses, others even to settlement. Uh, we are still relying on lane fed agriculture when yes. it comes to our staple food, yes. and that is maize. maize. So today I'm told, I was looking at some uh, literature there, we are importing up to 40% of our of maize, of our maize. Of our maize. Yes. mostly from our neighbor in Uganda, Tanzania again, but also we have some, some coming from way back, as far back as Zambia. Even, and other even the areas. president I think is importing, he was in Ethiopia and he signed a deal to import wheat. To import wheat, yeah, we are importing today. wheat, we are importing rice, rice we import almost 90% from Pakistan and other areas, we are importing Tomatoes, if you remember some, some months ago, yes. KFC uh, agri- uh, said or uh, revealed to us that they don't take their potatoes from our local market. Means we are importing even potatoes. Even potatoes. We are importing beans. We are importing, uh, we are importing uh, literally uh, many food items. From now, let me just pick, pick, your, pick, pick up from there a bit. Eh? Um, why don't you, you know, we, we talk about the, some of the things we import, some of the products we import, but for example, maize, 
we have also seen reports of maize rotting in the gallery, uh, in the go down, and people have been wondering, is our supply chain not also serving uh, the population? True, I would uh, say our marketing of products. Yes. How well do we market products? Are we in a, a, a funny country, if you allow me to call it, huh? where we see the biggest beneficiary of our farm produ produce is not the farmer, but the middleman. Mm -hmm. So for long, the middleman has pushed the prices so low for the farmers. He has made it literally almost impossible for the farmer to reach the ultimate market, yes. and he actually benefits, benefits in, between. in between. So you realize a bag of maize will go for 2,000 at the farm level, but in the market, it's 5,000. Yes. So what happens is that the farmer is not uh, motivated. Is not benefiting from the price increases in food. Because right now, the moment you are saying the cost of food prices have really gone up, the farmer is not benefiting. So what has happened is that the farmer is still discouraged. He still has to store much of his produce. He is not motivated to push his products to the market. Mm -hmm. And that could uh, explain why sometimes we see our food items rotting or people pouring milk and such other uh, our products. But if you allow me to finish on the point before I get trust on uh, production subsidy and uh, consumption subsidy, yes. is that uh, the new Ruto gov uh, administration has stopped off production subsidy. subsidy. Yes. And uh, we are moving away now from consumption subsidy. Yes. So the question is, uh, are we going to increase uh, production? production. Through fertilizer subsidy, are we going to increase production by not uh, maybe minimizing import? Because import. when you, you, you don't subsidize the consumption, yes. importers might have a problem with the market. Uh, why? If you don't subsidize the consumption, yeah. the importers might, might have a market. Why? Because the price is high. No, yes, that's one reason. <laughs> that's one reason. <laughs> you, you, you bear me witness that when the two kilos of ugali went above 200, mm -hmm. most people are now looking for what you call alternate, oh. alternate food. You might mm -hmm. eat some chips rather than ugali. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that uh, the normal economics mm -hmm. is that when the price go up, mm -hmm. the demand of a certain commodity will go down. Yes. And there's, of course, the alternate sources okay. of pro production. Yes. So what has happened if you're importing maize, mm -hmm. chances are you might not sell as it used to be. The consumption oh. goes down. But when, you, when it is subsidized, when it was at 100 shillings, mm -hmm. you'd remember everybody was in the supermarket carrying a jogo packet of maize. So if I, get, if I get you right, should we have an hybrid, an hybrid intervention where, as we still subsidize on the production, we can still con consider some, some, some bit of subsidy on consumption, but maybe at a lower level? Ideally, that would be the best thing. That's the best thing I would advocate. But again, the elephant in the room is do we have that money to subsidize consumption? I think they said for one month we had to use eight billion. Eight, seven billion. Seven billion to subsidize Unga, Unga alone. Yes. So it is not sustainable. I agree it's not sustainable in long run. Mm -hmm. So as we strike that balance, remember we are now in short rains. We might not harvest, we might not plant much maize now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only some few areas of Western Kenya where they do two seasons. Yes. Much of the uh, maize growing areas will only do one. So the short range might do a bit of beans, a bit of uh, potatoes, mm -hmm. a bit of maybe hay for, for milk production and others. Eh? So we might not see, in short term, mm -hmm. we might not see the benefit of fertilizer subsidy. Let me just ask you, um, I've, I've spoken to some economists somewhere who told me that Kevin, even if the production had, we have to boost our production now, the unga will not go beyond below 150 shillings. Do you think it will go below, especially for unga? I think, Kevin, I agree with that. We will not see a drastic decrease yes. in uh, prices. Because remember, as I said, the maize that we have in our gallery now is what is getting harvested now. And uh, that was not uh, uh, boosted by fertilizer subsidy. Uh, uh, so uh, the big uh, reason is uh, we have been in a drought, drought time for the last three years, so, yes. so production has not been uh, up to standard. Mm -hmm. I think uh, leading some analysis, we are experiencing up to 
forty percent drop yes. in our maize production yes. in uh, producing areas. In producing areas. So we still have supply. Uh, will I say sup uh, the, our supply is still, uh, still on the lower side? Oh. So we might, unless uh, we don't, uh, or rather we look for alternate. So as I say, if the prices remain high, mm -hmm. you'll be sure that uh, maize consumption will obviously go down. One of the reasons people consume maize is because the prices it's were low. low. Somebody will tell you it's cheaper to have ugali mm -hmm. than chapati. Than chapati. But if consistently now the price of unga is higher than that of chapati, people mm -hmm. might as well start Stick taking chapati, chapati <laughs> and uh, taking uh, rice and others. The unfortunate thing has been the price of rice and uh, wheat. wheat has also gone up, up, not because of our local conditions, but because of the war in Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is the uh, second biggest, if not the first biggest producer, uh, producer and export of wheat, oh. uh, which has been held somewhere. I know the, there is some uh, because of negotiations the with the, uh, yeah, because of the war. Mm. Uh, they could not get a lot of shipments out of uh, Crimea area. Okay. But there is some uh, agreement by Turkish, through Turkish mediation. I think they have released some several ships that are bringing rice on this end. Oh. So that might, uh, ease, might ease, eh? ease the problem. But uh, Back to the point, our maize prices might not go down. Maybe 150 would be a reasonable price to talk of. I want us to look at the next intervention, and this has been on access to financing. And I'm saying access to financing because when you look at the intervention on Fuliza, one product, personally I had a, a reservation with that because I felt it was mutilating someone's business, but the, the concept was we want to reduce the the, 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 the the cost of loans, that's number one. Number two, you're also removing people in, in the blacklist, the blacklisting so that rationing is done, it, it's done, and generally it's about access to financing. Um, the concept is for people to be entrepreneurial in nature. Do you think this intervention of allowing people, making people get the finances to uptake loans is going to work? Uh, looking at Furiza and other small uh, or medium uh, loan uh, facilities, mm -hmm. uh, you realize that uh, the people who are blacklisted is a guy who took a thousand shillings, five hundred shillings, yes. but in large numbers. Large numbers. So you might talk of fifty billion or hundred billion, but you realize it's spread, yes. it's thinly spread. Yes. So assuming we remove these people from the blacklist. Is it going to accelerate production? No, because most, are, most of these are the 5 million youth who is really accessible to these uh, mobile loan apps mm -hmm. who took maybe 100 or 200 or 1,000 and they didn't intend to pay back. So they didn't intend to They did not intend to pay back. Yes. Most of them will not intend to pay back. So removing them, we will only see another wave of people again getting the loans and again another wave of defaulters. Uh, what do they do with a thousand or two thousand? It's purely consumption. consumption. I don't think you can do any business with a thousand <laughs> or two thousand shillings. Yes. So in a short term, improve, improve consumption. Yes. In the short term. Yes. Uh, but as you like to say, Kevin, what would be the effect now on the on the provider of these loans? Yes. It will of course affect their their balance sheet. Their balance sheet. Uh, but I would want to shift to a bigger picture, the bigger problem we have. Yes. The bigger problem we have is we don't have loans for our businesses mm -hmm. and uh, you know what we'd call subs substantial loans yes. because banks have, are preferring lending the money to the government, not to the business. Not to the business. Banks are preferring lending to the government. Yes, yes. They have lent to the government huge amounts of money and they are not willing to lend to the government mm -hmm. because the government is taking their, their money at I think 12 percent yes and you know the advantage with the government you don't require a lot of paperwork mm -hmm. uh, def default rate default is, is, is non-existent yes and like so it's easier and they, they, they take huge amounts of money yes. so it's easier for a bank to do 100 billion to, a, to the government rather than get a thousand small scale small scale uh, business people who will take a million each. Mm -hmm. The paperwork involved, the, uh, the, the number of staff involved, mm -hmm. the default rate would be high. So the bigger problem we don't have money in circulation is because banks are not lending to businesses, mm -hmm. but they are waiting to lend to the government. Mm -hmm. So 
My advice, the best way would have been to throw government borrowing from the domestic market. Because I, I think right now they are really borrowing up to, uh, last month it was up to 400 billion mm -hmm. they have borrowed from the, from, internal, the, from the local market. From the local market. But they're borrowing another 900 billion, by the way? True, true, because you see our deficit, uh, according to the current budget, mm -hmm. was a whole 1.1 trillion. trillion. We correct 2 trillion, we had a budget of 3.36. Yes, yes. Yeah, so we have a whole uh, budgetary hole of mm -hmm. 1 trillion. Yes. Uh, the 1 trillion, most development partners mm -hmm. will not want to lend on uh, the current expenditure. Yes. So the development part of that was about 300 billion. Yes. Meaning about seven to eight hundred billion will have to be borrowed from the domestic from the market. market. Right. And lastly, this will be one of the most interesting ones. The concept of the Hustler Fund. Yes. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very good concept in terms of, and the, the question is just access to financing. And people have really brought up different aspects of it. I even really remember the Jalango, I think, Langata MP is asking, yeah. this money should be given to the MPs <laughs> because they understand the hustlers. But the question is on what would really work best, which model would work best for the hustler fund so that the uptake is high. Because the question, the point here is, and someone was saying that, not that we don't have these products. We do. These products are there, mm -hmm. but we've not been taking it. Yeah. The Hustlers Fund has been taken as a political pledge, yeah. and in the minds of people, they feel it's their right to get it. But how best should you think this will be implemented? Is it possible? Uh, let me call the Hasra Fund it's a political goodies. Sometimes as a politician, you have to rewind the people who, who voted for you. Yes. The uptake is always... We have three other facilities. We have the Youth Fund, we have... Uh, we have the three other fund. women fund and one more fund. Uh, the uptake has been very low because you have to get a good proposal for you to mm -hmm. give in a loan. I mean, you cannot just dish money. Yes. Somebody says, I'm a youth, all I need is money. So they have to come down with some business uh, plans. They have to develop products yes. that can easily repay for that loan. Yes. And I think that has been the problem with the youth fund, has been the problem with the women fund, has been the problem with small scale. There is one called small scale uh, entrepreneurs fund. Yes which were well funded and well meant, but yes. the uptake was very low. Yes. Uh, let me uh, say, on my thinking, the best way we can uh, put money back to the people. Today, the government owes businesses in this country in excess of half a trillion, that's 500 billion. Pending bills. Pending bills. Yes. These are monies owed to companies, from small companies to big companies. These are companies that most of them are closing down because they did business with the government, but they have not been paid. These are companies that were employing the same hustlers and the same youth. Because if you look at most of them who are doing small jobs like uh, road constructions, construction. some small buildings in the counties. The counties are even worse. I think counties' bills are over 200 billion. Yes. So if we do pay these people, we are going to inject half, uh, half a trillion into the market. It's really going to do wonders to this economy. The 50 billion hustlers fund might not be felt. I mean, this, we are talking of our, our economy is excess of 10 trillion economy. So if we inject 50 billion, that is 47. Had, if you inject it in 47 counties, you know it's per is county. It 50 billion per county? Yes. Or the whole? No, it's 50 billion per county. Per county. Yes. So we are talking of 50 times, it's about 300 billion. Around 300, 300, 300 billion. It's about 300 billion. Not 300, no, not 300 billion. billion. It's in the trillions. That would be 3 trillion. I, yes. I mean, did they say the county? I think the answer is fund is for the whole country, the 50 it's, billion. It's 50 billion. Because because it is, what they, they say is, what they say, what they say, what they say, what they say, I think there is that which government will provide and the county. And they are urging the county to make partnerships with banks too. Yes. Actually, uh, I need to bring up this to you they are now proposing the banks to the private banks to offer that hustler fund but government becomes the guarantor okay that is in the public private partnership so that it's it's floated you know it can't be floated like 50 billion you don't count once it's not something that's going to be done once but maybe it can be given two billion this year 
Uh, if you say it's a five-year plan, then mm -hmm. I would look reasonable. Because I was doing some quick calculations. If we do 50 billion per county, it's a whole 2.5 trillion. trillion. Which is so 2.5 trillion is equivalent to a budget. budget. Uh, 2.5 trillion is 30% of our GDP. Can uh, 10 trillion economy sustain uh, 2.5 and secure drones? Do not. No, I mean, not. it might collapse on, might collapse. Uh, on one end. But you know, it, will, it might also be money taken there and it's idle. True. I mean, we have had millions in the <laughs> aid fund, yes. which has not been utilized. Has not because been. at the end of the day, the only business, more, any business person will tell you, for you to get a loan, you have to show to someone, I'm going to do ABC. I'm going to start a border border. And these are, this is the amount I'm going to get per day, and I'm going to pay this loan this way. So uh, my fear is we might pump this money and end up being a con money to be consumed which will not help in the growth of businesses. But economics have always recognized something we call feel-good effect yes. in consumption. Yes. If you build a house, the feel-good effect for you owning a house would make you buy a TV, a bigger TV, buy, yes. buy some fridge, buy, and even increase your consumption. Increase your consumption. So in yes. sense, also increasing the fridge company or the, someone who is supplying the fridge, the, the, and the other items. The other items. So mm -hmm. if it will really cause a feel good effect in our country, the enthusiasm among the youth, mm -hmm. then it might have some good effect. Yes. Because right now we are suffering from a feel bad effect. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you have a feel bad effect in the economy, I don't want to spend. I'm no. feeling that uh, things are getting so bad. Yes. So we reduce our consumption, and the net effect, I think we saw that during the COVID period, yes. when people didn't spend, did people it's didn't like spend. the economy Was went, down. went down. So if it's going to have a feel good effect on our youth, because I think that's a big component of our people who are really mm -hmm. hard pressed by the economy, mm -hmm. it might jumpstart something. Mm -hmm. So we might get, yes, some successful businesses out of it. We might get somebody who's only needed, there was 100,000 to buy a border border or 100,000 to start a small uh, trading in the market. Uh, the important aspect is the feel-good effect. Because remember, uh, our African societies, our Kenyan societies, is the five million youth mostly have been supported by the older generation. There are another 500 people, who, 500 million, I mean, five million people who are working, who are parents, yes. they're supporting the other 500 million. Yes. I'll tell you, yes. some point in the youth, Probably he is staying in his father's place. He is eating from his mother's <laughs> kitchen. kitchen. So as much as he is in the number of five million, mm. he is actually relying on that dependent. He is a dependent on the other five million. But if we make this guy feel good, mm. with that he can start a small business, and uh, probably is going to relieve the other tax paying. Remember the other five million are the tax paying. Yes. We might relieve the burden of the other tax paying. We might improve on our tax remittances and of course on other consumption areas. Oh. Like. I want us to finish here. Um, the economists have spoken but one of the weakest links in the whole strategy is pilferage. That's what people call corruption. corruption. Do you think if that is sealed, we can have an instant effect, maybe in the next one year or few months of government? Yes, corruption has been our biggest enemy. I will always say our, our big enemies have been three. Corruption being one of them. Of course, the other one is bad governance. Bad governance. And of course, uh, uh, ethnicity. Uh, corruption has really uh, cost a big wound in our, in our economy and in, even in our social fabric in the sense that uh, money uh, gotten through corrupt means either tend to be hidden somewhere, uh, some is even taken outside the country, outside the country. some have really gone to consumption, yes. you know a guy buys an expensive, expensive bench, bench. is not having, I mean he's going to spend 10 million on something that is not having any effect in our economy. economy. So corruption has really eaten into our fabric of our economy and also into our society. We need to sort that out. I do hear the move to try and boost institutions, the police force, uh, the anti-corruption uh, institutions, the judiciary. Yes. 
to try and uh, fight corruption because at the moment the big problem we are having on corruption cases is that they take so they long. Take talk, they take so long. I was long. actually happy yesterday when I saw two, three cases coming into, into conclusion. conclusion. Because corruption cases, we always know, you are taken in for corruption cases, it's a seven year thing. So if they do that, one has up, taken long. They really take so long. That one has taken we, years. we still have agro leasing cases. Yes. We still even have golden bar cases yes, even golden within our court system. So if we sort that out, huh, mm -hmm. that would be a, a direction in the right, right. I mean, the, the right direction. But most importantly, also, mm -hmm. is uh, we also need to uh, get a direction on how our governance is. Yes. Remember, uh, at the moment, unfortunately, we have some people who still have many cases from yes. way up from the deputy president mm -hmm. to many governors and such. I would ask we sort those cases now mm -hmm. so that uh, people can have confidence to fight corruption. You know, even officers, we need to boost them. They're also Kenyans. Yes. They fear. I mean, you're not going to go and uh, interrogate a deputy president just like uh, you <laughs> do with a common one. I it's so easy. we need to sort those cases at the top. Then uh, we can work out on small corruption. Because small corruption, the police officer taking 100 shillings the police officer or the county official taking the 30 shillings in the market are really having an effect, especially on the Hasra economy. Hasra economy. It is important. The border board a guy who has to pay 100 shillings to, to, to maybe a county official or a police officer is harming his business as equivalent as somebody who takes a billion from the county. From the county. Like, thank you very much, Dr. Mohoho. Thank you very much. I hope we really uh, covered very important questions as matters of economy. We are waiting for the next few uh, days, for the next few months, if not years, whether things are going to be better. But then from where you said, do you think our economy is that bad? Uh, compared to our region, it's not so bad. We have had implosion in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'll tell you the Tanzanian, Zambian, Zimbabwean economy are on their toes. I think it's good to appreciate that uh, worldwide we are having the effect of the COVID. Remember, it's only been barely three years. Uh, the war in Ukraine, Ukraine, especially in countries that are energy importers, like yes. our country and other countries, it's having a big effect. I would say Kenyan economy is resilient. It's resilient, it's resilient. compared to what would have happened. It would have been worse. Uh, but you're not so bad off. You're not so bad. We are not so bad off because we have not defaulted. Not a single day. We have not defaulted on payment of our external debts. We have not defaulted. We have uh, had enough. I've not heard of uh, people rushing to buy dollars. So their foreign exchange reserves are still intact. It's still intact. So I know there was a scare when somebody said that we don't have enough foreign uh, exchange. Mm -hmm. But I think. Uh, the CBK governor assured people there are enough dollars. I've not seen any hike uh, in the dollar rate, so I would assume there are enough dollars. Our biggest savior is, uh, and we need to uh, recognize them. It's our diaspora Kenyans. Ken diaspora Kenyans. Diaspora Kenyans, I think that diaspora remittances is now our biggest foreign exchange China. It has mm. surpassed T. It has surpassed T. It has surpassed T. We are getting close to. Uh, I think uh, 47 billion dollars from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. That has gone up, but I think coffee, uh, tea is giving us about 44 billion. So we need to say thank you to people, our people working, <laughs> people working abroad. abroad. <laughs> I've also worked abroad for many years, and I know the, the, the sacrifices those people mm. go through mm -hmm. in order to send to the few dollars to their relatives. The 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 uh, so I think they have really sustained us in terms of our limitances in their limitances in dollars have really sustained our market. Uh, but uh, another area that is coming up is especially on our, on our horticulture. Yes. I think uh, the avocado exports the to China, the macadamia exports, uh, the traditional floriculture, yes. flowers from Naivasha and other areas have. We need also to say thank you to mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. guys who are doing that because yes. you have sustained our economy. They have sustained our economy. Sustained economy. Sustained economy. Wow. Thank you very much, guys, and you can also get to our comments and tell us what you think about the state of our economy, and we believe that we are not bad. Asante.